Let me ask you a question. How many of us can say God has done something in your life that you really didn't fully understand? I got a few hands, a few grunts, a few uh uh-huh. I can say it with a great big amen. I didn't, you know, it didn't mean that God was wrong that I didn't understand it. It didn't mean that God was doing something that he shouldn't have done simply because I didn't okay it. But yet in my life, I'll be honest with you, um, if, if I see it and understand it and it makes sense to me, I'll say, okay. But if it doesn't make sense to me, I'm like, I don't understand this. Why is this happening? Why is, why is it going on in this particular way? Uh, why is it that bad things happen to good people? Have you ever asked yourself that question? A lot of books have been written on that. Why is it that people have to suffer? Why is it that, uh, that uh, things that are, when you're, when you're trying to do all the right things, that the bad things happen? Well, that's a good question. You want to know the answer? You want to find somebody else because I don't have that answer at all. The answer that I'll give you is, is that there are things that are happening in my life that I just don't understand, and I don't know. And I, I don't know about you, but God's never come to me and asked my approval. He's never, he's never said, you know, can I run something by you, Brian? You know, there's some things that I, I'd like to do. Uh, could you tell me what you think about that? He pretty much just, uh, you know, since he's God, he pretty much just does whatever he wants to do. And I was thinking about this, and I've really been thinking about two, three weeks. It, it's taken that long for it to kind of percolate within me because I wanted to be able to say it in the right way. Isaiah said, the prophet Isaiah said in Isaiah 55, think, of what, think about these words. For my thoughts are not your thoughts, says the Lord, and my ways not your ways. For as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways and my thoughts than your thoughts. Now, it's pretty obvious that his thoughts are not my thoughts because they'd be mixed up, right? But the problem is, is that I wish that his thoughts were my thoughts. I may have said that backwards. My thoughts are not his thoughts. But I want my yes to be his yes. When he says yes, I want to say amen. When he says no, I want to say amen. When he says this is what's going to happen, sometimes I'm just left scratching my head. But listen, as the heavens are higher than the earth, so high are his ways over our ways. His thoughts over our thoughts. His will over our will. What he knows is good what I think is good, what he provides, and, and the Bible says that he, he gives us that which is best. But I look at it, and I think, this is what I want is best. See, the problem is, is that I'm able to look at things in time, but God's the God of eternity. He's the God that all those years ago, he was in present tense. He's never had a beginning. He's God. And he'll be able to hold us through to the end, all the way through to the end. He's God. I'm just simply been given this thing called life. The Bible says from dirt we came and dirt will will return, right? But I get a glimpse of the Almighty during this time. I, I can look at things from one perspective. I can see them through my eyes, through my emotions, in my brain, and in my will. And... I look at things how kind of I grew up, how my parents taught me, what I was taught in school, what my friends think about things. That's kind of how I look at things. But God is so much beyond that, so much, uh, so much beyond what we could see and know and understand. I look at it in one little sliver of light in one moment of time. But God looks at it through all of eternity. And I'm just getting one view, but he gets all the views. I look at it with a a, a limited capacity of understanding, but he understands totally. So when God does things, he does things a million years ago that might have ramifications today or in some point in time in, in time in future. But all I'm doing is I'm looking at it here. I'm looking at it through my emotions, and we understand that our emotions are temporary. God's not controlled by emotions. He's controlled by the fact of his perfection, that he is God. 
And he only knows, listen to me now, he only knows how to do that which is good and right and best. I just take a stab at it. So as his ways are so beyond my ways, his understanding, I have to come to a place where I don't understand, but I have to learn to believe, listen to me now, and trust and know that God's got this. Paul said it as well in Romans chapter 11, verse 33. He said it this way. And, and by the way, this is a doxology. I love the doxologies of the New Testament. It's like, especially Paul, he'll be riding along and everything will be good. And then all of a sudden, he just has to, under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, he's like, man, this is good. It's all the, the great things that God's doing. And then he just stops and says, can I just pause time out and say, I love you, Lord. You're just great. You're just so wonderful. You're just so awesome. And that, this is one of those doxologies. He's writing the letter to the Christians that are in Rome, and he says to them, Oh, the depths of the riches, both of the wisdom and the knowledge of God. How unsearchable are his judgments and his ways past finding out. Paul's like, he is, he is so blessed, he's so led by the Holy Spirit, and he's writing the words of God for us, but then he's saying, you know, his ways are so much beyond what I'll ever know. They're unsearchable. I'll never find all of these things out. And by the way, none of us will this side of glory. When we're here in time and we're not with him in glory in heaven, we're never going to know all the, the things that are happening. There are so many things that I've looked back upon and said, why? Why, Lord? So many times I thought I had things figured out. And I had plans. And y'all know I, I think I know everything, right? And, and I'm a control freak. And I believe I, I'm just going to try to make all these things happen. And God's just laughing at me like, you're going to control this? Good luck with that. How's that going to work with you? And there's some times that I just think, it's just so plain this is will of God. Why don't people see it? Why don't they understand? Why don't they do these things? How many of y'all have gone to the election booth and went in there just knowing God's will and you just filled out your ballot and put it in and things didn't turn out the way you wanted it to? How many of you went to the doctor and just thought, it's just gonna, this is going to be easy, it's going to be a checkup, but then the doctor said, uh, I need you to come back, we need to have a talk. Any of y'all ever had the talk with the doctor? Those phone calls? As a pastor, I can tell you, I'll go to bed at night and think, think everything's done, and you get the call in the middle of the night. When everything's somebody's family's, it's, it's all upside down. I've been at the bedside. When children, with parents, tears flowing down their face, when children went to glory. No, I don't have words for that. I don't have the understanding for that. But I'm grateful I know the one that does. I'm grateful that there is a God who there, who, who, you know, the word cosmos means order. The word chaos means out of order. I'm glad that this God that we serve is the God who puts order in the cosmos. Who everything is beautifully put together exactly the way that God would have us to have it. And God does that. Now, there's another thing God did for us, though, because he loves us. Are you listening? There's over 300, over 330 times in the Old Testament where the prophets would tell us this is going to happen. This is the way it's going to be. And they would tell us those things, listen to me now, ahead of time. So then later on when we saw it, we would say, hey, isn't that exactly the way that he told us it was going to happen? And it wasn't just things that were normal, like the sun will come up in the morning. The sun will go down. Well, I, you know, I saw it come up this morning, and it's probably going to go back down tonight just like it did yesterday. Amen? Forgive me. My, my, my third boss is talking to me here. It's just going to have to hush. Amen? Y'all know my third boss, right? The Lord Jesus is my boss. My wife is my second boss. And my insulin pump is my third boss, so y'all have to forgive me for that. But if I didn't tell it to hush, it was going to do that to all, the whole service. So if you see me doing like this or something, it's because it's being mean to me. <laughs> Amen. Now, of all the things I say in my sermon, that's going to be the one thing y'all remember. Anyway, right? 
Over 330 times in the Old Testament, it told us things that were so unique, that were so unbelievable, right? So that when they happened, we would look back and we would see the hand of God and his goodness. I want to talk about some of those because I'm, this is Christmas season and we're going to talk about Messiah. There's over 330 prophecies that have to do with that term Messiah, God's anointed one sent to be the Savior of the world. All right? Let's look at what some of those are. Number one, Messiah would be born of a virgin. That's Isaiah chapter number 7, verse 14. Now that's unusual. How many of you know how children come to the earth? I hear some giggles and I see some nods. I mean, how we get here? Well, God put a plan in place. And there's, there's two things that you need, amen? Number one, you need a woman. You're like, preacher, where are you going with this? You also need a man, right? Now, I don't care what science says today. You still need a woman and you still need a man, right? But he says in this particular time in Isaiah, he says a child is going to be born. There. It's going to be the Messiah, and he will be born of a virgin. Now, at that point in time, let me just tell you, my brain goes, what? I kind of know how this works. I got three kids. Amen? And there wasn't a virgin in the process. Right? So let's look at what God's Word says. Take your Bible and turn to Luke 1, verse 26. You should be there. Are you there? Say amen. You're not there? Say wait. All right, here we go. Verse 26. Now, in the sixth month, the angel Gabriel was sent by God to a city of Galilee named Nazareth to a virgin betrothed, engaged. It was a set up marriage. That's the way they did it in that day. The family there put it together, but they had not come together as husband and wife yet. Betrothed to a man whose name was Joseph. We'll talk more about him in a moment. Of the house of David. Joseph fulfilled a scripture too. He was from the house of David, just the way scripture said. The virgin's name was Mary. And having come in, the angel said to her, Rejoice, highly favored one. The Lord is with you. Blessed are you among women. Now, if Gabriel showed up at your house and knocked on the door, what would your uh, thoughts be? Well, number one, yeah, uh-oh would be a real good one, right? Uh-oh. Uh, I don't, wh why are you here? What are you, and, and what, what he's saying is very flattering, and it, it's got her just, uh, it's got her like, I don't understand. Kind of like most of us as we go through the day. I don't understand why this is happening. Verse 29. When she saw him, she was troubled at his saying. Well, amen. And what manner of greeting this was. Then the angel said to her, do not be afraid. I guarantee you if an angel showed up at my place, I'd be afraid. It's out of the norm. It's, it's unordinary. Mary, you have found favor with God. And behold, you will conceive in your womb and bring forth a son and shall call his name Jesus. She knew what that meant. Jesus meant Jehovah is salvation. Mary, you're going to have a child. It'll be a boy. This is what you're going to name him. You're going to name him Jehovah is salvation. He will be great. Will be called the son of the highest. This is God's child. Mary, the Lord God will give him the throne of his father, David. She had heard the sermons. She had been to synagogue school. She now is starting to understand this is Messiah. He will reign over the house of Jacob forever, and of his kingdom there will be no end. Then Mary said to the angel, what in the world are you talking about? No, that's not what she said. How can this be, since I do not know a man? I, I hear what you're saying, but I can't give birth to a child when I've never been with a man. Virgins don't give birth. Virgins don't give birth. I, how can this be? God sometimes tells us things that we don't know, but he's still got a plan. A plan that was put in place all those years ago when Isaiah wrote them down. 
He said the angel came to her and said, the Holy Spirit will come upon you. The power of the highest will overshadow you. Therefore also the Holy One who is to be born will be called the Son of God. Mary, I know you don't understand this. I know this doesn't make any sense whatsoever, but listen to me now. God's going to put a child in you. I've always kind of said it this way. 23 chromosomes of Mary, human. 23 chromosomes of the Holy Spirit, God. Fully man, fully God. The God-man, God's Son, the pure one, without sin, without the depravity of life in him in any way whatsoever. This was God's plan. Did Mary understand it? No. Was it beyond her understanding? Absolutely. But she had to approach that like we have to approach his truth. Okay, I don't understand, but yes, Lord. She really went on to say, just the way you want it, Lord, let it be. Here am I, Mary, your servant, just the way you want. Folks, when we find that there's truth that are there, it may be hard. When we don't understand the circumstances of life, that may be very hard. But God only does that which is good and right and best. And by faith, we have to see that, believe that, trust in that, and act upon it. Let me ask you, what choice do we have? Well, let me talk about some of the other things that God said. Number one, Messiah would be born of a virgin. Number two, Messiah will be called a Nazarene. Isaiah chapter 11, verse 1. Well, now we're going to bring Joseph into this. Take your Bibles and turn to Matthew chapter 1. Matthew chapter 1. If you're not there, follow along with me as I speak it. Matthew 1, verse number 18. Now the birth of Jesus Christ was his following. After his Mary was betrothed to Joseph, before they came together, she was found with child of the Holy Spirit. Can you imagine the conversation Mary had with her mom and dad? Can you imagine that? Here's this teenage girl. Um, I'm pregnant. With whom? Uh, with God. I'm still a virgin, but I'm pregnant. How well is that conversation going to go over? Right. Sure you are, right? Then she goes and Joseph has to find out. Listen to me, has to find out. You know what, jo what did Joseph's parents say? Joseph, I'm sorry we put this marriage together for you. I thought she was going to be the sweet, I thought she was going to be the perfect wife for you. I'm so sorry. We'll, take, we'll help you take care of this. And Joseph decided that he was going to put her away quietly. We're, gonna, we're just going to annul this thing before it ever gets started. We'll, let, we'll just bless her. We won't make a spectacle out of her. Look what it says in the next verse, verse number 19. Then Joseph, her husband, being a just man, not willing to make her a public example, was mindful to put her away secretly. But while he thought about these things, behold, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream, saying, Joseph, and then says, son of David. One of the criteria here reminded him, Joseph that you're one of them. Do not be afraid to take to you Mary, your wife, for that which is conceived in her is of the Holy Spirit. She wasn't, she, she didn't betray you. This is something that's of God. She has got child, but she's a child of the Holy Spirit. She will bring forth a son. You will call his name Jesus. The angel told Mary, it's Jesus, Jehovah's salvation. The angel also told Joseph the name. It's Messiah. He understood, he knew, for he will save his people from their sins. At this point in time, Joseph, had to, he had a choice that he had to make too. In his emotions, all since he heard, he had to be saying, this doesn't make sense. But now he's saying, Lord, I don't understand, but I trust you. I trust you and I believe and I will follow you and I will do exactly what you would have me to do. So that it was done that it might be fulfilled which was spoken by the Lord through the prophet saying, Behold, the virgin shall be with child and shall bear a son. They will call his name Emmanuel. Mark led us in that song. 
which is translated God with us. And Joseph, being aroused from his sleep, did as the angel of the Lord commanded him and took to him his wife and did not know her till she had brought forth her firstborn son and he called his name Jesus. God's ways are so much beyond our ways. His thoughts. Let's talk about some of the others. Number three. The Messiah would be born in Bethlehem. Who can manipulate that where you're born? Nobody can, obviously. As a matter of fact, God got Caesar Augustus to be a part of this. Not a believer, the most powerful man in the world, but God allowed a tax from Caesar to be held and that you had to go back to your birth city the city of your clan, your tribe, and there pay your tax. So at just the right time, Mary's with child, Joseph's with her, they haven't come together, but she has to go with her husband, Joseph, to the town where his family was from, Bethlehem, because Scripture said over 800 years earlier that that's where the Messiah would be born. Caesar Augustus had no clue he was being a part of it. But God looks at it from all the different angles. And God's got all the different things happening. What about when the child was born? And there was another man that was brought into this by the name of King Herod. He wasn't a believer by far. He was a a terrible, terrible man. And he was jealous. Remember when the wise men came and they said, where is the Messiah supposed to be? And Herod got the the, the wise men around him and, and, and said, the scripture says in Bethlehem. And, and so he says, when you go, come back and tell me. So just the way scripture told it, all those years earlier uh, in Hosea chapter 11, verse number one, an angel came and told Joseph, do not go back to Nazareth. Don't stay here. Go to Egypt for a season. And in Hosea 11, one, the angel told him, said that the the Christ child, the Messiah, would spend a season in Egypt. And also, after Herod died, he came back and came to the city of Nazareth so that he could be called a Nazarene. And also, in Jeremiah chapter 31, they said when the Christ would would be born, when the Messiah would be born, there would be a massacre of children. And Herod, being jealous, had every child two years and younger of the Jews killed. All those things that didn't make sense and that that no one understood. Unsearchable things fulfilled in the Christ. Let me talk a little bit about Christ as Messiah. Psalms 41 verse 9 says that Jesus would be betrayed. When Jesus began his ministry, he called 12 disciples to him. And they walked with him and they saw the things. The most learned of the twelves, the only bilingual one among the twelve disciples was called Judas Iscariot. He saw Jesus give sight to the blind, raise the lame where they could walk, cleanse the lepers, take fish and bread and bless it and broke it. And, and, And thousands were fed. And as a matter of fact, Judas was one of those who took a basket around so that people could get from it. He, I... He was an eyewitness of the power of God. He saw him walk on water. If there was anybody who should have been the greatest testimony that this is someone so out of this world, so good, so kind, so gentle, it should have been Judas Iscariot. But he betrayed him like Scripture said he would. And going on from that, it even tells us in uh, Zechariah chapter 11, verse 12, that the money that was used to betray him would be used to buy a potter's field. And after Judas betrayed Jesus for 30 pieces of silver, he went back and gave it to them. He said, I don't want it. And they said, no, 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 we can't do that. And they took it and bought a potter's field with it. Fulfilling Scripture. Exactly the way God said it was going to happen. He would be hated without a cause. Psalms 35 verse 19. Psalm 69 verse 4. Why in the world would anybody hate Jesus? He never did anything wrong to anybody. And those people that were right there in front of him 
who studied scripture hated him, yelled, crucify him, crucify him. They wanted him dead, falsely accused. Psalms 35, when he stood there, not one person could bring an accusation against him. Isaiah 53, verse 7, when they brought all those accusations against him, he never said a word back. They spat upon him, and they beat him. Isaiah 50. Scripture literally says that they will spit in his face. And that's exactly what they did. That he would be crucified among criminal, criminals. Isaiah 53. That they would give him vinegar to drink. Psalm 69 verse 21. A Roman soldier did that. That his hands and his feet would be pierced. Psalms 22. Zechariah 22. You know the crazy thing about this? To pierce his hands and his feet, we look back on it and we say that's crucifixion. That's exactly what happened. He was crucified. The problem with that was when those prophecies happened over 800 years earlier, crucifixion had not even been invented. Babylon would come and take over the world. After them, the Persians would come in and take over the world. The Persians invented crucifixion. It was perfected by the Romans. So when it says that his hands and his feet would be pierced in his death, crucifixion had not even been invented. Nobody had even thought about it. But God knew it beforehand he saw every little detail beforehand when I was in the womb he knew everything about me today God knows every hair on my head every thought in my heart every action of my life and yet he has put all those things in place for me because he loves me and he's there to guide me. And not one thing has happened that he hasn't seen. Not one thing has happened that man may look at it and say, this was meant for evil. But sovereign God, God who is king and in charge, can take those evil things and make good out of it. And we think things are out of control. And yet, God's perfectly in control. We look at our life through the filter of our emotions and we say, I don't understand. That's all of us. But just let me remind you, God understands. Why would God bring over 330 prophecies? Listen to me now, listen well. So that we would look back on them and say, he said that beforehand and it happened exactly like he said it would. Now we can look at our life and we can learn to trust him, not to be afraid of him. That when things look like they're backwards and out of order, they're not out of his hand. They're not out of his power. They're not beyond his love. They're not beyond his ways. You're, I hope you're listening. You can trust him. You can believe in him. It's okay. The way that you come to know God is you hear about him and then you begin to hear it personally. There's that thing that comes, and I, I want all of us have this. It's that knocking on our heart and on our conscience and our thoughts. We have to sense and believe we have to trust. I remember I was 10. And I knew the things that I had heard about God. And I believed in those things. I believed in Jesus. I believed that he was God's son that came to this earth, that died on the cross, that rose again and is alive and well. He died so that I could be cleansed of all my sins and I could have a relationship with him. I believe those things here. But then he began to talk in my conscience and my heart. And I understood that God died for me. And God wanted a relationship with me. And God wanted to save me. And I had a decision at that point in time. 
Do I trust him? Do I truly believe? Is this what I need to do? And all the evidence was there. All the evidence was there. But yet it was a personal decision that I had to make in that moment. But hear me, church. We have to live the same way. We have to know and believe. And yet we have to trust. And it's beyond our ways, but yet we have to know that God's got a plan. And he wants to invite us to be a part of that plan. And we don't have to know everything to know the one who knows everything. And by faith, we get it out of our hands and out of our control and put it into the control of the one who can take care of those things. It's the same way everybody's saved, becomes a Christian, and it's the same way we must live. The Christmas season tells us that God's got this thing perfectly in control. And there are some times that we need to remember that. In my years, I don't know that I, I've, I've seen things that I, I've always had things that I didn't understand. And I, I've always had things that I said, Lord, only you know. But this year has kind of taken the cake a little bit, hasn't it? And yet I believe God's trying to tell us. Right here in our heart. He's speaking to us personally. He says, I love you. I got this. I know what's happening. I'm not asleep. I care. I care for you so very, very much. Do you trust me? All the time before you were born, I had it. All this time, after you pass through this earth, I'll hold it and I'll keep it forevermore. Through all of time, listen to me now, through all of eternity, held by the hand of God. God's telling us that that pattern, that place, that way, it's the only way to live. Don't answer this question, but let's think about it in your own heart. How many times have you looked back on it and said, he was right. I didn't understand. He was right. I serve an on-time God. Who cares? I serve a God who's got this. And he's been keeping me every step of the way. That's the kind of God we have looking out for us and loving us. Do you trust him? Oh, it's easy to trust him when everything's going just the way you want it. But do you still trust him when everything seems upside down? If you've never trusted him to be your Savior and your Lord, the way doesn't change. You have to go to God and you have to speak to him personally. You do that by prayer. And you just come as you are. That's the way he wants to receive you. Repent of your sins. Lord, I've done wrong. He already knows them. He just wants you to say that they're wrong. Tell him you believe in him, that you know that he is God's son that came to earth to die on the cross and rose again, is listening to your prayers even now. And then ask him to save you from your sins. Ask him to forgive you of your sins. Listen to me now. Ask him to come into your life. Tell him all my life I give to you. Be my Savior, my Lord. He'll save you. In a miracle of miracles, the greatest miracle of all, your life will be changed. You will be forgiven. He will send His Spirit into you, and you will be whole. And He'll be there with you to walk with you every step of the way. Sometimes He kind of gives you a hint and lets you know what's coming. Sometimes He doesn't. But whether he gives you a heads up or not, he's got it. And one thing I can tell you, he's done right by me. Heads bowed, eyes closed. If you're here today and you've never prayed that prayer, from your heart to God, you need to pray that prayer right now. Lord, I'm a sinner. Jesus, I know that you came to earth to die for me. 
And I know you died on the cross of Calvary. I know they buried you in the tomb, and I believe that you rose again, and you're hearing my prayer. Jesus, I turn from my sins. Forgive me. All my life I give to you. Come into my life and save me. If you'll pray that prayer from your heart to God's heart, He'll hear and He'll save. One of the greatest words I know in the, utter, in the New Testament is that He saves to the uttermost. Beyond what you could even could possibly comprehend, that's the kind of God that we have. If you prayed that prayer this morning, would you just lift your hand right where you are? Yes, thank you, Lord. For those of you who are watching online, whenever you hear this and you felt that tug on your heart by God to your spirit, and you prayed that prayer, you didn't have to be in the church building to pray the prayer. God's on the throne in heaven, and he heard, and he knows. The Bible says, whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. There's great, great comfort in those words. Now we've just got to trust him. Walk it out every day. Seek to try to do what he has us to do. Seek to please him with all of our heart. Father, thank you for doing what you've done for us. Thank you for telling us ahead of time. I mean, this was some strange things that you told us, but Lord, you fulfilled every one completely and totally. Father, we believe in you and we trust you. Father, we put our lives into your hands. And Father, we're going we're gonna to still have to walk through this world and we're not going to know all the things that are happening, but Lord, we're going to know you, the one who is greater than all of these things. Lord, I pray that you encourage our spirit today. May fear fall by the wayside because we know the Creator God. Oh God, we love you. Oh God, we love you that you loved us first. In Jesus' name I pray, amen.